depending on where you're joining us from today. I'm in Colorado and our featured presenter Linda Masterson is in Florida. Welcome to the third in our series of virtual workshops. I'm Kathy Prudhomme, the Community Outreach Program Manager with NFPA's Wildland Fire Operations Division. Today's session is Surviving Wildfire, Get Prepared, Stay Alive, Rebuild Your Life. This session is being recorded and will be available on our online courses and education page at firewise.org. Before we get started, just a quick overview of the workshop, workshop format for today. During the first 30 minutes, I have the privilege of asking Linda Mann a series of five questions, and then for our last half hour together, she's going to respond to four questions selected from those submitted in an opportunity we provided a few weeks ago to registrants to submit a question related to the topic. If there's the time at the end of those four questions, we'll try to take some more from the group. So take a look at your screen, and if you're interested in submitting a question, there's a box on the right hand of your screen. If you have a Google account, you're not going to need to put in your name, but if you don't, if you don't mind putting in your first name and putting your question in there, that would be much appreciated, and hopefully we'll have time to go ahead and get to those um, towards the end of the presentation. So now it's my honor to get to introduce you to Linda Masterson. She's an author and researcher, and Linda is also um, an award-winning author and researcher. Excuse me. Her book we're talking about today is Surviving Wildfire, Get Prepared, Stay Alive, Rebuild Your Life, a handbook for homeowners. It was written after her home and 72-acre tree farm were destroyed in a 2011 Colorado wildfire. Having navigated through the loss, Linda made a commitment to help other wildland urban interface homeowners learn the steps they need to take to be prepared before a fire and what to expect during the evacuation, recovery, and rebuilding stages. She also developed a surviving wildfire pocket guide full of checklists and customizable information that the first hundred registrants for today should have already received. Copies can be ordered from her site at survivingwildfire.com. In addition to her books, Linda's articles have appeared in the New York Times Sunday Magazine, Log Homes Illustrated, Countryside, New Pioneer, Animal Kingdom, and many more publications. I met Linda at our Backyards and Beyond conference in November of 2013 in Salt Lake City where she was a presenter. And I just have to add, she's also one of the nicest people on the planet. And a big welcome to you, Linda. I'm going to jump right in into the first question. In 2011, you lost the Ridgetop home where you and your husband lived on 72 acres in a Colorado wildfire. That experience moved you to write Surviving Wildfire, Get Prepared, Stay Alive, Rebuild Your Life, because you wanted to spare others from having to live through what you and your husband endured. Will you take a few minutes and share some details about what you experienced that day in April three years ago? Thanks, Kathy, and thanks for having me. You know, our long, dry winter and warm, dry spring had everyone worried about what the coming fire season was going to bring. We were anxious about leaving for vacation on Sunday. That Friday, about three miles away, a young man cleaning up his property tried to burn his slash. When his illegal burn got away from him, he panicked. He wasn't prepared for anything to go wrong, so he ran, leaving his fire behind him to grow. By the time the volunteer fire department arrived, it had grown to about 25 acres, still pretty small by wildland fire standards. We followed the progress very anxiously on our scanner and heaved a big sigh of relief Saturday morning when we heard it was officially out. But you know, fire has a mind of its own. Late that night, the wind started to howl and teased it back to life. It was after 11 when a loud boom woke us up. The sky was orange and black. There were flames stretching across the closest ridge top less than half a mile away. We turned our scanner back on just in time to hear one of the firefighters say, it's gone. We were spotters for our volunteer fire department, so we knew that meant the fire that was out was now out of control. This massive wall of flames teetered along the top of the ridge, just long enough to give us hope it might move away from us. 
But you remember the video of the tsunami in Japan? Seconds later, it looked just like that, but it was a wall of fire that was pouring down into the valley. My husband, Corey, grabbed our neighbor alert list and started making phone calls. I run faster than he does. So I raced up and down the stairs, throwing our packed bags into our cars. Thank goodness our fire bag full of important papers and some emergency supplies was sitting in the garage. Otherwise, there is no way we would have remembered it. There was no time to think. In just minutes, we were running for our lives. That drive down off the mountain was terrifying. More than a mile down a one-way road with long drop-offs and no street lights or guardrails. The air was so thick with smoke, you could barely see. When we finally made it to the bottom, Corey ran to wake up one last neighbor who hadn't answered his phone. When I looked up and saw the entire ridge in flames, my head knew that our home was gone. But my heart kept clinging to the hope that in some mysterious and miraculous way, the fire had missed us. Thanks to Corey, all of our neighbors got out alive. But by the next morning, our dream home was just a pile of ashes. After a lifetime of hard work, everything we owned fit into the back of our car. All we had left was each other. Linda, I'm so sorry. Your story is experienced way too often. The next question that I'm going to ask you was, was there something in particular during the following months that motivated you to write the book? I know what you're all thinking. That's not going to happen to me. Disasters are things that happen to other people. Because that's what I thought, too. So even when I was working 14 hours a day, trying to keep up with my regular work, clean up our home site, and slog through the full-time job of filing our insurance claim, I had this overwhelming need to reach out to people and make them understand just how important it is to really get prepared, not just give it lip service. I've been a researcher and a writer my whole life. I communicate for a living. I knew if there was a way to get through to people, I could find it. So a couple of months after the fire, I wrote a short article for our community newsletter, sharing some of those lessons we'd learned the really hard way. And the response was overwhelming. I guess there really is no wake-up call like one from someone who has lived through your worst nightmare. I think that was when I decided that when we got back on our feet, I was going to write a handbook to help others. And you know, when I spoke at the Firewise Backyards and Beyond conference last fall, I was really struck by a poster that said, your home doesn't have to burn. People need to hear that message. When you finally get it, it's very empowering. But you know, it can also be a little scary because now you don't have permission to just cross your fingers anymore. Now you know that what you do could save your home or even your life or make starting over so much easier. Your suggestions are going to help a lot of people get motivated and productive. Our third question is, September is National Preparedness Month. And you know a whole lot more today about wildfire preparedness than when you first moved to Colorado from Chicago. From what you personally experienced in 2011, what wildfire preparedness actions would have been highest on your personal to-do list if you knew then what you know now? You know, I'm sure a lot of experts would say something like, clear your roof and gutters or mow the grass around the house. Get rid of that bark mulch. Those are all important things to do that could save your home. But if I'd known then what I know now, the first thing on my list would have been making sure we had enough insurance to start over. Statistically speaking, most of you listening are underinsured. We were too. I try not to think about the fact that we were planning on reviewing our insurance as soon as we got back from vacation. That decision to put it off really cost us. We had no idea that in the 10 years since we'd built our house, building costs had more than doubled, and building codes in the WUI had changed. We had great insurance. We just didn't have enough of it. 
So even though we collected our policy maximum, it wasn't enough to rebuild our home and replace all of our stuff. Land and infrastructure like wells and utility lines and septic fields, they're not covered by insurance. So buying land and starting over from scratch was out of the question. But we were very lucky. Back in 2011, home prices were still down and eventually we found an older log home on a few acres north of Fort Collins. But if we'd just taken the time to update our insurance, we would have had many more options. Insurance companies do such a good job of making us feel as if they'll take care of everything. But getting a major loss claim settled can take a year or more of hard work that no one can do for you. And I definitely would have done a much better job of documenting our belongings. Who knew we'd have to list and value every single thing we lost, from our hiking socks to our family heirlooms? Our inventory ended up at more than 2,000 items, and it would have been even longer if we'd had enough insurance. Honestly, to this day, we are still trying to figure out what was in one of the boxes in our storage shed. If you think you could do that from memory, try listing the contents of just one closet and then go see how much you missed. My friends say I must have had an angel on my shoulder because I finally stopped procrastinating and took about 70 photos the day before we were supposed to leave for vacation, which turned out to be the day our house burned down. It took me about two hours to take those photos and transfer them to my computer. I just wish I'd taken about 200 more. In this digital day and age, there is no excuse for not having a photo record of your life. So pick a room and get going. Open up your closets, cupboards, and drawers. Don't forget the floors, the ceilings, the kitchen, the baths, the garage, the attic, your art, your collections. When you're done, store a digital copy somewhere safe and off-premise, not in a fire safe. They are not designed to stand up to the hours of extreme heat produced by a wildfire. Those photos not only helped us with our claim, they gave us something that helps us remember when. The photos you took that day are probably some of the most important ones you've ever taken. So our next question is, staying with the theme of your book, Talk to us for a few minutes about the three topics in the book subtitle and give us an action item or two that goes with each. Get prepared is the first topic. Getting prepared is the foundation of everything. You may not be able to prevent or control every wildfire, but you are in total, complete control of how well prepared you are. No one ever regrets what they did. It's what you didn't do that will come back to haunt you. Our fire was a perfect storm. The forest was bone dry. The winds were hurricane force. It blew up in minutes. It traveled faster than a freight train and threw off flaming firebrands for nearly two miles. But in a more typical surface fire, most of the homes that are lost could probably have been saved if only their owners had given them a fighting chance. Fire looks for the path of least resistance, so go walk around and see what would lead it to your door. I used to have baskets of pine cones sitting on my stairs in my deck. You just don't think about that stuff. Clear at least five feet around your house. I call it the Firewise Five. Mow your grass and clean out your gutters Get rid of anything near or under your deck or house that could catch on fire. Too many homes burned down because an ember landed in a gutter full of pine needles or firewood stacked on the deck. Stay alive. Of course, staying alive is job one. You need to make sure everyone in the family knows what to do and is totally prepared to evacuate on a moment's notice. No matter how calm, cool, and collected you are, you will not be able to think clearly. So don't make yourself think. Get everything organized and ready ahead of time. Make lists of what you need to add at the last minute on brightly colored paper 
put them in very obvious places. One very organized friend of mine who's been evacuated several times has color-coded lists, green for her, orange for her husband. One of my neighbors was so rattled that she packed the kitty litter and left her computer and cell phone on the kitchen table. I know people who forgot how to manually open their garage doors. My brain was so frozen that after we finally got out of our canyon, an emergency responder had to show me how to turn off my bright headlights. So think, plan, practice now. So when you have to leave, you're on automatic pilot. Plan for all those what ifs. What if the power is out? What if your main escape route is blocked? What if you're not all together? Register all your phones with reverse 911 and create your own neighborhood phone tree. I'd recommend investing in a scanner so you'll know what's really going on when fire is threatening. And don't just sit there and wait for someone to call you and tell you what to do. Our house was already on fire when our reverse 911 call came through. If you feel threatened, you should go. Most of the civilians who die in wildfires waited too long to leave or ran back to get one more thing. What if you do lose your home and you have to start over from scratch? Thousands of homes burn down every year. My heart just aches for those people because I know what lies ahead. Losing your home and everything you own is a profoundly life-altering experience. Your life will eventually get better, but it will never be the same. It will always be divided into before the fire and after. You know, the odds that your home will burn down may be small, but the price you'll pay for being unprepared if it does is well beyond your worst nightmares. If you know you did everything in your power to save it, and you've made sure you'll have the resources you need to start over, it makes getting on with your life so much easier. So if you don't do anything else this week, figure out your cost to rebuild, read the cover page of your insurance policy, and make an appointment with your insurance agent. You can download a list of 10 questions to ask them from my website. Those of you who are listening live right now, you may have to wait a day or two, but it will be there shortly. Linda, tell us the URL for your site and where the 10 questions can be found again. My site is www.survivingwildfire.com. Great, and the, thanks. The questions will be under the insurance resources. Your book is such a great source of information. I, You and I talk about this all the time. I recommend it to people because it's written in such layman's terms. But I'd like to ask each of our, I always like to ask each of our presenters to recommend a project that our participants could accomplish or at least get started when this weekend gets here as they work on their wildfire mitigation and preparedness to-do list. So can you give us some things that people could do? I'm a writer and a researcher. I want to know what, I want to know why, and I want to know how. Surviving Wildfire isn't a memoir. I wanted to write the book I wished I'd had. So it's full of practical tips and get real advice from real experts, as well as people who've been through it. So maybe my first suggestion would be start reading. But why wait for the weekend? Seriously, I have no problem making lists. My problem is crossing things off the lists. So I try to break my to-dos down into more manageable things. It's the old, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time with a little hot sauce. Photograph living room or clean the gutters is much less intimidating than do photo inventory or make the house firewise. You can probably check either one of those off in an hour or two. Don't think about the whole job ahead of you. Just start nibbling away at it. Doing anything is better than doing nothing. Linda, great advice. We're going to now move into the questions that were submitted by participants. Our first question was 
surprisingly very similar from two different fire chiefs. They're Mark in Idaho and Michael in Oklahoma, and I sent them both emails and asked if they minded that I kind of morphed them into one because they were almost identical. So their question is, as you reflect on your personal experiences, in your opinion, what types of involvement, actions, or plans should fire departments prioritize for their community as it relates to life and property safety issues? You know, that's a great question because there's no doubt that most people in the WUI look to their fire departments to be the local authority on wildfires. I think one of the challenges facing fire departments is changing people's mindsets from we're here to save you to we're here to help you save yourself. People who move to the WUI often bring their city and suburban expectations with them. So it's really important for them to realize that in a big wildfire, there are never going to be enough resources to park an engine and a crew in every driveway. I know a lot of firefighters, and I know they wish they could save every single home, but they can't. Is the driveway wide enough for a truck? Is there a place to turn around? Is there another way out? Is the house defendable? Or are there trees hanging over the roof and six cords of wood on the deck? The answers to most of those questions aren't up to the fire department. They're up to the homeowner. But people need to know that. And they need to know what you're looking for. How about a how defendable is your home checklist? Our volunteer fire department does a lot of outreach. Some firefighters make house calls and they give people tips on how to make their home and their property better able to survive a fire. Some fire departments have great websites with lots of information and links. And I'm very proud that several volunteer fire departments use my book and the pocket guide as thank yous for donations. You know that knowledge is power, but information alone might not be enough. Sometimes you need to offer up inspiration and motivation to get through to people. A community preparedness workshop is a great way to get everyone fired up. A, work, a workshop can bring the fire department, the Red Cross, the Forest Service, NFPA, insurance experts, and all sorts of other local sources and experts all together. You want a format that allows for demonstrations and exercises people can participate in and makes it easy to get your questions answered. You can often find grant money and sponsors that will help with expenses. I've spoken at several workshops that were very well attended. People walked out of those workshops convinced they needed to be better prepared and with action plans to get started on. Once you can start shifting that burden of responsibility to people, it's much easier to get the community involved and get programs moving forward in the same direction. If there's a community newspaper or e-newsletter, a regular column from the chief with helpful hints and to-dos based on the time of year and the local fire outlook and other local conditions is a great idea. A calendar with a column of tips for each month would also be good. If there could be anything scarier than having your home burned down, I think it would have to be having your home burned down with you in it. Staying alive is a matter of knowing when, where, and how to get out, and what to do if somehow you're trapped. Evacuation planning is just so important a bullet point handout that tells people what to do if fire is threatening and what to take if they're evacuated that they can post on their fridge is great. And one last thought. Many people don't realize their cell phones are not automatically registered for reverse 911 or that there are emergency alert systems that will email and text them that they can sign up for. So let them know. Thanks, Linda. 
The next question is for Bob. He's an insurance consultant, and his question is, you discovered part of the recovery rebuilding process after the fire is navigating the insurance claims process. What tips can you give today's participants as it relates to actions before a wildfire and post-event to help them be better prepared for filing a claim? If you lose your home in a wildfire, your insurance will suddenly become your best friend or your worst enemy. It should be your lifeline to recovery. It will determine what the rest of your life is going to look like. But really, who reads their insurance policy? Most people have no idea what it covers, what all those schedules mean, or what they're going to have to do to collect. People think it's like life insurance. If your house dies in a wildfire, it pays up. I remember standing in our ashes with our adjuster and saying, so, since the house and everything in it is gone, will you just pay out in full? And then feeling my heart sink when he shook his head and said, I wish we could, but it just doesn't work that way. Then you find out just how big of a job you have ahead of you and how unprepared you are to do it. That can make people really angry because at that point there's nothing you can do about it. More than half of the people who lose a home in a wildfire are just like we were, clueless and underinsured by at least 25%. The way homeowners insurance works, that can add up to hundreds of thousands of dollars you can't collect. Don't base your insurance on what you paid for your house, what it would sell for, or what you owe on it, unless you want to give all the proceeds to your bank. You're going to need enough money to rebuild your home and replace what you lost in today's dollars. So get a ballpark estimate from a local builder or check a program online like hmsfacts.com and then sit down with your insurance agent and go over every schedule on your policy. The only stupid questions are the ones you don't ask. Find out if you'd be able to, to rebuild somewhere else or if you'd have to rebuild on site. Could you buy another home or do you have to rebuild? How much would you have to replace your belongings? What are your detached outbuildings and landscaping covered for? Would your insurance pay for you to live somewhere else if you're evacuated or if your home is gone or uninhabitable for a long stretch of time? Also, most people make loads of improvements to their home and that increases the value, but they don't tell their insurance company. It's pretty hard to claim you upgraded your kitchen or finished your basement or installed another bathroom if you can't prove it and you never reported it. I already know the answer to what's the worst thing that can happen, so I think people make a big mistake trying to buy the cheapest insurance they can find. But there are plenty of ways to save money on insurance without scrimping on your coverage. If the worst happens and you do lose your home, that loss is much easier to deal with if you're prepared to collect and you know what to expect. I remember walking around in our ashes with our adjuster's boss a few days after the fire. He told us to think of filing our claim as the hardest job we'll ever have with the biggest payday at the end of it. A lot of people have a very tough time dealing with the claims process, but for us, that advice was empowering. We'd worked hard our whole lives and he made us believe that if we worked hard now, we'd collect everything we could. So we ended up treating our claim pretty much like a gigantic client project. That really helped us divorce ourselves from the gut-wrenching realities of remembering and describing and valuing everything we used to own and love. It took us about six months, but we did collect our policy maximum. 
Linda, it just seems weird to even have to ask you next, another question after listening to that, but let's move into the third question. It's from Elaine in Colorado, and she asks, a friend wasn't home when an evacuation order happened, and her husband quickly grabbed the most bizarre and random items before leaving. Did you have a list that you used, and how much time did you have to pack? You know, I've seen video of people packing produce into their cars. So tell your friend not to be too hard on her husband. No one can think clearly with a fireball breathing down their neck. That's why it's so important to think through ahead of time what you're going to do. We gave ourselves 15 minutes to wake up all of our neighbors and get out. A lot of people were asleep when we called. 14 homes burned down that night. Our 911 call came in after our house was already on fire. And our house caught fire before we got to the bottom of our road. So maybe we stayed a little too long. We had a fire bag with our important papers and a few emergency supplies permanently packed in the garage. All I had to do was grab it and throw it in the car. I really do wish I'd posted a list of what to add at the last minute. Maybe if I had, I would have remembered the charm bracelet I'd had since I was a teenager and my dad's Marine Corps wings and the file of all the improvements we'd made to our house and forgotten to tell our insurance company about. As it was, we took the bags we had packed for vacation. What could be handier in the mountains in early April than a couple of suitcases full of shorts and flip-flops? Luckily for us, my laptop was also packed and ready to go. My husband's computer with all of our company books and records and files, that was all destroyed. I grabbed three quilts made by our grandmothers off our loft railings as I ran down our stairs for what turned out to be the last time. Those were the only sentimental things we saved. So don't be me. Get your act together ahead of time. Put together an emergency kit and leave it in your primary vehicle or the garage. Clothes, snacks, water, flashlights, batteries, first aid kit, copies of all your important papers. Then make a gather and go list. All those things you can't pack ahead of time and you don't want to forget. Insurance policies, important documents like birth certificates and passports, medical records, tax and banking records, account numbers and passwords, prescriptions, eyeglasses, cash, and don't forget to write down cell phones, chargers, tablets, computers. And then take a minute and really think and list what you don't want to live without. If you escape with nothing but your life, eventually you will come to terms with it. But it can be hard to forgive yourself if you could have taken your wedding album or your grandmother's recipe book instead of the TV. So I want you to really think about what would leave a hole in your heart if it was gone forever and make a list. Don't worry about what things are worth. All that matters is what they're worth to you. Write down where things are. You won't remember. If there are items like old family photos or the kids plaster handprints you can crate up and leave somewhere they're easy to grab, do it. Anything you can do to make things easy to find and easy to load will help. Every second counts. Buy a bunch of tote boxes and store them somewhere. They're easy to grab and pack. Just don't stick your lists in some file. Post them somewhere you can see them. Inside the pantry door, on the garage wall. This will also come in handy if you're not home and someone else is doing the packing. And put a copy on your phone or tablet. Linda, this is a weird question. And <laughs> we haven't talked about this before, but hearing you talk, out of all the times I've spoken with you, I've never asked you, how long were you displaced from that night when you evacuated until you were able to move into the next home? We were pretty lucky in that way. We were able to move into our new home the beginning of September. 
of that year, which is pretty much lightning record speed for anyone who's had their house burned down and had to do a major claim in a wildfire. So where did you live in between the time the house was lost and September? Well, we were very lucky. Our insurance did provide what's called additional living expenses or temporary living expenses. And so our insurance company rented a house for us and they even furnished it. So we were able to stay there while we were working on our claim and looking for a new home, cleaning up our home site, trying to get our life back together, all those things that you don't give any thought at all to until all of a sudden you're in a motel room and you literally own nothing. So did you guys stay in a shelter for any period of that time? We did not stay in a shelter. We stayed in a sort of a little mini suite in a motel for a couple of weeks and then we moved into a rental home. But I know a lot of people whose insurance did not provide for additional living expenses and if they didn't have friends or relatives to stay with, that was really hard. Thanks for sharing that. I, for some reason, just listening to, your to you talk made me think of that one. Our next question is from Chris in New Mexico, and he wants to know, if you had a friend or relative considering moving to an area with a wildfire risk, what advice would you give them? The number one thing I'd tell them is to dream with your eyes wide open. Ignorance is not bliss. It just makes you oblivious. Before you buy a home or a piece of property, learn everything you can about the area you're moving to. See if there's a community wildfire risk assessment and a plan in place. Finding a firewise community would be a real plus. Have your dream home or your dream building site inspected by a wildfire expert and find out what you could do to improve your odds and make your life more defendable. Talk to an insurance agent before you buy, not after. Make sure you can figure out whether or not you'll be able to get the kind of coverage you need and want. If you're going to build, you have a golden opportunity to build your home with wildfire risk in mind. Our fire department worked with one homeowner while they were designing their home and they made so many changes to their plans and even their site location. And then wouldn't you know it, their home was put to the test in the High Park Fire in 2012. And despite the fact that crews could not reach it, it saved itself and survived. Don't count on your builder or your real estate person to clue you in. They kind of tend to avoid talking about things like wildlife issues and droughts and fires. But don't be afraid to live your dreams. Our years on the mountain were some of the best years of our lives. Instead, you know, be aware, be informed, be prepared. You will sleep much better at night knowing you've done everything you can do to give your home every opportunity to survive and to make sure you have the resources you're going to need to start over if you have to. Linda, thanks. That was the end of the questions that were provided ahead of time, which I guess is a really good thing because we have some questions from participants today that I'm going to ask you. So know that these are questions that we might have to answer together and we might even have to refer them on to somebody else. Um, depending on what you feel confident in asking and then between the two of us we'll give it our best shot. But I will throw this out that if people will ask a question and if we use your question in today's workshop we'll send you a copy of Linda's book. So you might have to send me your um, email address, those people that ask the question and then afterwards we'll get that book in the mail to you. The first one comes from Christy and Christy wants to know if you can share with the group how much extra updated insurance can cost above and beyond the typical coverage. Do you hear that, Linda? Well, I think what she's asking is, how much will it cost me to get my insurance up to where it should be? That sounds uh, like it, yeah. 
And I, I think the first thing is that really depends a lot on how much insurance do you have now. I, very interestingly enough, I worked with the recovery manager for the Boulder Four Mile Canyon fire when I was researching my book. And he was so horrified at how underinsured people were, he actually went home and rebuilt his house on paper, figured out he was grossly underinsured, and he doubled his homeowner's insurance. And I think he's only paying about $100 more a year. That would be $100 really well spent. You know, if money is tight and you really have to figure out where am I going to trim? Ask your insurance agent, what can I do to reduce my premium? Are there features I can add to my home? Are there things that will reduce my premium? Can I bundle my coverage? Can I increase my deductible? All those things are better options than being underinsured. Well, at $100, when you put it that way, that's like less than the cost of ordering a pizza to be delivered once a month for the year. That's pretty reasonable. Pretty reasonable. Well, our next question is from Bill, and we'll, I'll ask the question to you, and again, we'll see if we both need to chime in or if we need to pass it off and get back to everybody through a, a blanket email. But he says, if egress roads are blocked, and if your property has defensible space, is it at all feasible to hunker down or shelter in place until the fire passes? Would fire blankets be worth stocking and would portable oxygen supplies be needed? Or is it simply an impossible situation? So do you want to attempt that one first, Linda, and then I can help if need be? Well, it's very interesting because there's a whole section in my book on what to do if you're trapped at home that I actually worked with some very top um, emergency firefighter responders because I knew I was not an expert in that area. And I have to say, you know, he's got two different parts of that question. If you can't get out, then you really have no choice except to shelter safely at home. If you can get out, then it's much, much better to leave safely. You know, if you, I, I personally and experts also agree that uh, having fire blankets, having, making sure you're wearing the right clothing when you're evacuating, if there's any chance you might be in a fire situation, you don't want to be evacuating wearing, you know, polyester that's going to melt on you. You don't want to have short sleeves. You want long sleeves and um, sturdy fabrics that are going to be you know, easy for you to wear and and protect your body. The whole thing about oxygen, I wouldn't want to tackle that one because, of course, oxygen greatly increases the ability of a fire to burn. So I would want to have um, an expert weigh in on should you have emergency oxygen. Now, I, I have a sort of funny line in my book that some people think they can shelter in a pond or in a lake, but I learned that a lot of people who do that end up with pretty serious burns on their faces and the parts that are sticking out because, you know, you do have to breathe. So maybe unless you have scuba gear. Um, I, do, I do have a lot of information on what you should do like I said, that's in the book, and I would like to refer to it before I answer that question any further, because this is literally a life and death decision. Absolutely, and I think most fire professionals would definitely say leaving early is your best option. Don't wait to be told, like you said earlier in your one of your comments, is even if you're waiting for a reverse 911, if you feel threatened or endangered or that you would be much more comfortable and have a peace, mind, peace of mind, go ahead and leave early. Now, if you're trapped and your only option is to stay in your home, then being in your home is definitely better than being in a car, which is definitely better than being on foot. But I hope that most people will 
listen to the information that you've shared and provided and say it's not worth staying. It's not worth trying to defend my home. I need to evacuate and get out of the area safely. One of the problems that comes from people that stay too long is often firefighters will need to go in if they know people are trapped and that takes them away from being able to work on the fire. So for everybody it's just better to evacuate quickly could not agree with you more. In fact, I have a very good friend who'd always said, I'm not leaving, I'm going to stay and defend my home. And our fire hit their subdivision, which is not really a subdivision, but hit them about an hour after it hit us. And they drove out with through literally a wall of flames the scariest thing in their entire lives, they said. And he said he would never think about trying to stay at home anymore. The first sign of threatening and they're gone. It's just one of those things, you know, firefighters train, they have special equipment, they have special gear, and layperson just need to leave that world to them. We actually got another question. This one's from Brianna. And Brianna wants to know, Linda, if you had a replacement cost policy and is there anything to check if she has one? Yes, that's a great question. We did have replacement cost coverage and you should definitely check to make sure that that's what you have and you don't have a policy that provides what's called actual cash value. Because replacement cost coverage works this way. If you have a TV and it was $2,000 and it's eight years old and now the insurance company thinks it's worth $200. If you have replacement cost coverage, your policy will let you go buy a new TV for $2,000 and will pay for it. If you have actual cash value, you're going to get 200 bucks. Thanks, Linda. I'm waiting to see if we're going to have another question, but let me go ahead and, and we'll keep you on the line since we have a few more minutes. But I just want to remind everybody that today's session is going to be available at www.firewise.org. It takes our tech expert, Aaron, about a half a day to get through his emails that he's encountered while we've been on the call and get some other things done. But he's promised that that will be up and on our website tomorrow. So if you want to refer anyone to watch the recorded version, just let them know that's where it resides. And it will be up there for, for many months in our archive so people can go there and watch it. The other thing that I want to let everybody know is that registration will open soon for our October 23rd workshop and that one is improving access for firefighters and equipment and it's going to have a lot of tips on what people can do to improve accessibility for firefighters. We're going to look at your driveway, the turnaround radius, what you can leave for firefighters behind and things that you can do that will help them when they arrive on scene. We're going to talk a little bit about what firefighters might look for on a defensible property? Are they going to have to pass one by that hasn't done anything because of their own firefighter safety? And really how they go through that triage process in looking at homes. So that registration's not up yet, but it will be open soon. So you can keep going back to our firewise.org page and checking that and make sure that you participate in that one towards the end of October. We are very happy to say that our first two sessions in the virtual workshop series were limited to 100 participants each, but we have switched over to a new platform and we're not limited to that same 100 people. So definitely, even if you think about it on October 22nd and realize you didn't register, go ahead and sign on on the 23rd and join us for that one. Linda, I really want to thank you for being our presenter today. You are so awesome for your willingness to share what you and Corey experienced and how you navigated through that process. I can't recommend or encourage people enough to go to your website, to look at the book, to look at the pocket guide, and really read through the information. I know that you consulted with a lot of people when you wrote that book. You worked with insurance professionals, you worked with firefighters and emergency managers, and there's just a wealth of information that people can access and resource on your site and within the book. So our 
thanks to you for for sharing there sometimes I feel a little bit guilty asking you to share what you guys experienced because I know it's very personal it's still painful so our thanks to you for your willingness to do it you know I want to thank you for letting me have this opportunity to reach out to people because that's why I wrote the book I I really wanted people to have a resource and I wanted them to understand what it will mean if they lose their house and how they will feel if they didn't do everything that they could do and every single time I do a presentation I sit there and I think what can I say to people what can I show them what can I tell them that will move them to actually take action so I'm hoping that something I said today really struck home with everyone who's listening and right now they're scribbling little notes to themselves or making little post-it notes and as soon as we get off the air they're gonna go and do something that's awesome why don't you share one more time your website and tell people how they can get your book my website is survivingwildfire.com if you happen to forget it I'm very easy to find if you search surviving wildfire or my name Linda Masterson I will pop right up you can order the book from my website and the pocket guide and I promise you you can read it in less than a couple of hours Linda thanks again so much and let me say this if anybody has any questions for Linda and you have want to get something to her personally even some comments reaching her you can always send your emails to us you send them to our general firewise box on the firewise homepage or feel free to send them to my name which is not so easy it's my first initial C and then Prudhomme P-R-U-D-H-O-M-M-E at NFPA.org and thanks again Linda for all your help and the great information you shared today you're so welcome. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone, for joining us.